I'm Elizabeth Melton, Public Engagement Director for the Institute for Diversity and Civic Life, and I'm conducting interviews with the Luce Foundation's COVID-19 Emergency Grant Network for the Grounded Knowledge Project. We're meeting in the Fetzer Institute boardroom in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and Andrew Davis is our videographer. Today is Thursday, June 1st, 2023, and I'm joined by Drew Smith. Uh, Drew, can you please introduce yourself? Well, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I teach at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. I'm the professor of urban ministry there and formerly, formerly the director of our Metro Urban Institute, which is one of the outward facing units at the seminary. It's been around actually since 1991 and has a, a very strong foundation of community engagement at uh, various levels, a lot of grant funded projects, working with congregations, uh, working with uh, networks beyond that, a lot of nonprofits, non governmental organizations, and with an emphasis in, um, on communities that are enduring social struggle of one form or another. Our, our seminary is in the heart of the city, the heart of Pittsburgh, and we're surrounded by neighborhoods that have undergone significant shifts and changes over the last 30 years. And, and uh, Metro Urban Institute has been one of the uh, places within the life of the seminary where the connections have attempted to be strengthened. And where engagement has uh, take up, taken on some, some very specific and hopefully helpful kinds of dimensions. That's great. Um, so can you tell me a little bit more about the Metro Urban Institute and particularly um, their project with the COVID-19 emergency grant network? Right. So. We were very happy to uh, get the invitation from Luce Foundation. Uh, as a current grantee at the time, we have another grant uh, that we were working with, with the Luce Foundation. So we, we were happy to get the invitation at the, uh, at the very strategic time in the, the crisis around COVID to uh, be one of those uh, one of those places where there could be some further connecting with communities that were on the front lines that were being uh, particularly impacted by, by COVID. We, we focused on several networks within uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, in most instances, these were organizations or networks that were uh, already well in place in, in our relationships with the city. There was an emphasis on looking at the ways that infrastructure that was already weak in many instances, social infrastructure that was already weak in many instances was further disrupted by the COVID emergency. Uh, one of the things that we had a particular emphasis on were uh, persons at the young end and at the older end of the age spectrum. So we, we were very interested in how young students were being impacted with schools being shut down. And at that point, uh, the, schools, the schools were shut down in Pittsburgh. In fact, by the time we got the grant, I believe it was in around June, uh, schools had been shut down and public schools had been shut down in Pittsburgh for three months. And oftentimes the students uh, did not have any alternatives. And one of the real gaps was that these students also did not have access to laptops. So we, we channeled a significant portion of the grant money toward the Pittsburgh public school system to purchase laptops. Uh, I don't remember how many we purchased. We purchased quite a few that were, that were then uh, donated to, or actually we just donated the money to the Pittsburgh public school system. They purchased the laptops, were able to get these laptops distributed uh, in places where they had real impact uh, and, and where there was real need. Similarly, uh, a couple of the local faith sector, community sector organizations that we worked with, uh, the Homewood Ministerium, the Homewood is a um, particularly challenged, socially challenged neighborhood near the seminary. 
the ministerium there has uh, been very active in the community on multiple fronts, and uh, we also were able to channel some money their direction for laptop purchasing, but not only laptop purchasing, um, but, but also the kind of wraparound services that are needed for people to be able to make good use of laptops. Sometimes that, that meant a little bit of assistance with training. Uh, it meant uh, internet access. Uh, it, so it, me it meant several things in addition to the, the hardware itself, software in some instances. So we worked with them on that. Another one of the organizations was the East End Cooperative Ministries, which is a sort of multi-service um, ministry almost directly across the street from Pittsburgh Seminary. They work particularly with the homeless population. Uh, so we, we were able to work with them to uh, in, in get some, some um, to, to address some issues related to access again. Uh, one of the things that uh, they have specialized in with the homeless population has been helping to connect uh, those persons with access to job conversations job training. That was disrupted by COVID. Uh, laptops helped a little, but there were all sorts of other services that we, uh, we also addressed with that organization. Uh, one of the primary uh, Latina, Latino serving organizations in Pittsburgh, an organization called Casa San Jose, has really been the go-to place for many of what is a growing immigrant and migrant population in Pittsburgh. Still relatively small compared to the, to the uh, broader population, but growing and, uh, and, and many of those persons coming in very easily fall through the social cracks. So Casa San Jose stands in the gap for them in, in multiple ways, uh, helping with the translation services so that, so that people can sort of navigate the systems educational systems, social services systems, and so forth. So there were a lot of, a lot of ways that uh, they needed support and assistance, uh, particularly during the COVID shutdown because of disruptions that sort of uh, appeared uh, along sort of the, the, the channels of access. And so uh, those were, and then it was an organization in our Hill District that we also worked with that is uh, the historic Hill District, August Wilson Plays and so forth does very uh, important work in the neighborhood as well around social services. So, so we were very much focused on how to assist with sort of channels and structures of support for communities that really needed support and whose support was further marginalized and jeopardized by the COVID emergency. Yeah, I can, I can really see how y'all played this kind of bridging role between resources and these kind of, um, these organizations and helping them um, to meet some of those kind of, you know, structural organizational needs that they needed at that time. Um, thinking about the larger kind of work that the Metro Urban Institute does, was this uh, a change in any way? Is this very much kind of I'm, I'm thinking in terms of like the pandemic kind of being this big rupture in society mm -hmm. and how things went. Was it a surprise that this is kind of how y'all ended up moving forward during this time? Or, or did it seem like a natural continuation of, of other work? I think it really was a natural continuation, unfortunately, which means that these are ongoing problems. So historically, and, and like I said, we, we go back over 30 years uh, my predecessor was very active in attracting um, grant monies around these kinds of uh, social supports in the community, working again through congregations and through community-based organizations. So, so this really builds on work that's been ongoing. We, we've, we've got strong networks with not only pastors and faith leaders, but Leaders in the public school system, um, leaders in social services, political leaders. So we, we were able to, um, to really sort of mobilize existing networks and relationships, build them out in a particular way at a, a very strategic time. So, so that was important. The other thing that we did, 
it wasn't so much related directly related to the grant money but but clearly related to the ongoing work Metro Urban Institute does and and the way the ways that Metro Urban Institute uh, attempted to respond to the moment uh, part of what we do we're a research institute we're, we're not just kind of a, a, a direct services in fact we, we were, we're less direct services than we are research so the the uh, the loose rapid res response grant gave us an opportunity to to build up and build out our direct services but uh, as a research institute we thought it was important to really get voices platformed and so we we uh, really attempted to do that a couple of ways and what one of the ways was that we we reached out to and and we invited all of our uh, all of the organizations that we that we contributed to during the, through the rapid response grant to share a little bit about their story, how, how, what they were seeing in their context and how they were responding to it. And, and um, we're, we have those stories and, and we're really trying to uh, make those stories uh, accessible and available. But beyond those specific stories, uh, we were able to uh, mobilize almost 40 persons, scholars, leaders, uh, who were in their own respects on the front lines of COVID responsive, responsiveness and asked them to write up um, scholarly essays that were, that were then published as, a, as an edited volume with Rutledge Press, a uh, book called Racialized Health, COVID-19, and Religious Responses, I believe, is the title. Great essays that uh, were not only specific to Pittsburgh, but, but uh, looked at context, particularly looked at the most heavily affected communities around the country, but also across the transatlantic region. Uh, that is related to work that uh, I also uh, am in leadership with an organization called the Transatlantic Roundtable on Religion and Race. And uh, we are a coalition of scholars and clergy leaders and students and community leaders across the transatlantic region, the Americas, Europe, Africa, uh, we've now been around for a dozen years. In fact, we're, we're having uh, our next transatlantic conference in just a couple of months in southern Africa. We, we've, we usually meet on an annual basis. We've more recently shifted to biannual. But we produce a lot of publications out of that work. We, we convene dialogues. We immerse ourselves in local context of struggle. So the racialized health volume not only picked up on our local work in Pittsburgh through Metro Urban Institute, which is closely related to Transatlantic Roundtable, at least through me, if not beyond, but actually much beyond because quite a few persons in our Metro Urban Institute network have also been part of our Transatlantic Roundtable network. So, so it picked up on the local context and stories and voices, but also picked up on voices and stories and context in the UK in Canada, US, Caribbean, multiple countries in Africa. So it, we think that's a very important response uh, to the moment of, of the COVID emergency that, that also grows very organically out of the work of Metro Urban Institute. Yeah, it seems like there are so many threads that kind of continue, and particularly when you're working at that intersection kind of, of institutions and structures, right? They, they all kind of come together Indeed. and coalesce in different ways. Um, thinking back uh, also to, to that moment of, of the pandemic, were there any um, unanticipated challenges that came up in that grant period um, or things that you had to, you found yourself kind of having to react or respond in a way that you didn't anticipate. One, one issue that, that presented that we hadn't really paid enough attention to going in was the way seniors were impacted. 
should have been something that was obvious but wasn't necessarily. We, we, um, we, we really were focusing from the outset mostly on the younger end of the age spectrum, really concerned about students and, and with, with, with good reason. Uh, schools being shut down and that was just a big issue all over the news. It was in your face. So, so we were very concerned about that issue, but as we were talking with our community partners, they reminded us that seniors were also a population group that were being heavily affected by this in the sense that um, with so much of the social system shut down, that included their ability to be able to uh, transport from one place to another, to get groceries, to go to medical appointments, uh, to, to get ac access to other services, public buses. Public transportation is, is obviously something that uh, low-income seniors are going to be heavily reliant upon, and public transportation was severely impacted by the shutdown. Uh, the, the ability of seniors to be able to gather, I mean, community, being in a community, being part of a community. And for many seniors, that, that meant that they were living in senior facilities where the, the in-gathering is, is, is a very important part of the, the spiritual health, the mental health, even the physical health of, of that population. Those things couldn't happen during the shutdown. And, and so... We were able to, one of the, in fact, I, f I forgot to mention one of our key uh, organizations that we, that we uh, contributed to, uh, Bible Center Church in the Homewood neighborhood is a uh, relatively small congregation in terms of numbers with a massive community ministry, and, and um, in, including providing all sorts of food services out in the community. Uh, they had... Um, they have transport services for one thing or another, but during the COVID shutdown, they readjusted some of their work, particularly to address issues of senior isolation. So making sure that food packets were available for seniors and that um, their vans that might, might have been used previously for other kinds of community transport were now delivering food packets to seniors in the senior, the senior facilities and even in... Um, um, private homes. So, yeah, the impact on seniors was one of the uh, real kind of awakenings that we had. But, but just the more we talked with people in the community, the more ways we, we, we learned just how um, infrastructure and support services that we otherwise take for granted can be so severely impacted when one thing or another gets thrown off just a little. And in, this, and, and in this case, things were thrown off a lot. And so that really had huge impacts on people. Yeah, and as I'm, I'm hearing you talk again about so many of these different networks and systems, it also is kind of making me think about, so what was just the, the small day-to-day -day experience for you and other folks at the Institute? Were all of these, the, this coordinating, was it all happening you know, virtually from home? Um, were you all able to ever meet in person or go out to partner with some of these organizations in person or was it all that COVID Zoom from, world? From March 2020, <laughs> the, the seminary was closed in terms of in-person uh, presence on campus. So we went virtual by the end of March, which meant that the work that we were doing was virtual. So we're reaching out to our partners via email, via telephone, um, the, the kinds of ways we were engaging with them were, were, were virtual. They, they were, um, you know, through electronic communications. Uh, we were able to get the resources to them electronically. They did what they needed to do in, in shop in their instances, but even for them, they weren't able to be in person with many of the persons that they were actually providing services to. So 
everything was thrown off. And, and so community was, was disrupted in that instance. But, but as, as we, we all learned during the shutdown, there are so many ways to be in community that we perhaps underappreciated and uh, were, were under attentive to prior to the shutdown that, that then emerge and develop as, as new sort of vistas, uh, new, new capacities for being in community, in communication, in contact with, with one another. Not just what we do on Sunday morning with our, with our congregational work, but, but uh, even the ways that we respond to local communities. We, we, we do have resources that we've now been able to develop further and appreciate further for doing that kind of community work. Yeah, I think that was one of the biggest shifts, right, is we all kind of had to, to come to relate to one another and to the world in a different way. Um, thinking about kind of this journey that you and the Institute went on during this time, is there, do you have any advice for other people if they were to find themselves in this situation again? What were some of those kind of lessons that you learned or things you wish you'd done differently the first time around? Well, I, I, when, when, you, when you find yourself cut off from normal channels of communication and access, one thing that, that emerges as having great importance is your pre-existing networks. So, and, and how you have massaged and nurtured those connections, those connecting points. So I guess it it, um, it kind of underlines the importance of working as hard as you can to to, to make sure your your networks and your relationships are up to date, are current, that that you you've got um, you've got good ways to reach out to persons. You, you're not starting from scratch. You're not scraping the dust off of a relation so so where where we have constituencies that are of central importance to the work we do let's not wait for an emergency to be in contact right we we need to keep relationships current keep them active so that when we absolutely must be in communication and contact that comes more easily. It comes more readily, more organically, because it's important that it's important for the work that you do. It's important for the communities and constituencies that you serve, that you're ready to reach out and embrace when it's most needed. And and and, and part of that is 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 a systems issue. It's it's a preparedness issue in lots of ways and. Um, in the same way that, that we would approach our own sort of nuclear families. What, what are we doing in an emergency? Do we, do we have an emergency system set up for communicating? If, if you're like at school or if, if you're on the job, and I'm in, how, do we, how do we connect up in emergencies? It, it's just, I think it reminds us that, um, that as, as, multifaceted and complex and and resourceful as our systems and processes are in the global north in the western world they're still very fragile and and so we we need to prepare for disruptions and i think that we're we're clearly in a season in a period of time where we can't take things for granted. We, we really do need to be thinking about contingency plans straight across the board. Yeah. Um, now, we've only got a few more minutes, but I wanted to, to give you an opportunity. Is there anything else, thinking of this as going into an archive, is there anything else you feel like uh, future scholars or other future listeners should really take away? What should they know about your project and the work that you were doing? Well... I, I think we we had a, a good range of partners to, to work with in this instance, people that 
institutions and leaders that were well placed, that were strategically placed with communities of struggle. So if, if our concern, if our issue that we're trying to respond to uh, is in fact um, something that uh, particularly affects persons on the social margins, uh, hopefully you've got a good network of, of leaders and institutions that are doing that good work. And, and we're, we're very fortunate at Metro Urban Institute and Pittsburgh Theological Seminary to, uh, to, to have a good network that's been developed over a period of time. Like I said, over 30 years at Metro Urban Institute, and, and we have other uh, outward-facing institutes and units uh, at the seminary that are also doing good work with, with, the, with the, uh, the sort of range of concerns and issues that they're working on. So, so that's important. But the one thing I, I do come away from this with, too, as, and, and it gets back to what I was saying earlier about um, the connection between my work with Metro Urban Institute and my work with Transatlantic Roundtable on religion and race, I... I as urgent as things were in Pittsburgh, in the United States, they were even more urgent around the world, and particularly in the global south. And, and I, I would just hope that one thing that we learned from this COVID emergency is, is that, is that, is that uh, the needs are great beyond the borders of this country. And we have tremendous resources in this country that we need to share. I mean, when we think about the ways that the vaccine rollout took place, for example, Global North context had first access, Global South context did not have good access at all. And this, is what, this, this was one of the kinds of stories that, that really was emerging, not only in the, the stories that we were gathering through our work, but that were very public stories. So I would hope that for those of us operating in the U.S. and in our more resourceful context here, that we certainly are as responsive as we can be to our immediate constituencies, particularly those that are most heavily impacted and affected by crises within our context, but that we also see ourselves as global citizens operating within a global context with obligations, not only to our local constituencies and concerns and, and context, but to that global context that we are also a part of. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's all we have time for today, and I think that's a lovely note to end on. Thank you.